Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you give to us, uh, especially for the gospel, for the good news of your love for us in Jesus Christ. And, um, and there's so many people in the world uh, that, that haven't heard or have heard a distorted form of it or, or just need to hear it a little more, um, and certainly all of us do. And, uh, and so we pray that you would uh, just open our, our eyes and our hearts to, uh, to see the, the blessings that you have for us and, um, and to benefit from them. Uh, and so that we can share them with others so that they too may receive those benefits. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, so, Giving the donuts at, um, at roller skating, um, I think then people, because I have always said where I get them from. I get them from church. Well, one night, um, a gal in the booth next to me, I don't know her, she just leaned over and asked me if I would pray with her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is, you know, this this is really this is exactly what we're talking about. And uh, although I, I have to uh, sort of a sorry, not sorry, um, that we're we're gonna get to the nuts and bolts next month. All right. <laughs> and you're like, when are we gonna? You know, there's there's been a lot of of uh, sort of preparation stuff, and tonight's gonna be all about preparation. And um, and I know there's 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 a uh, you know. Oh wait, I forgot to start this. Um, there's a desire to, to jump right to, like, okay, let's get down to business, you know. Um, but I really think, and, and I think that, uh, that you'll see tonight um, that there's a reason for all of this preparation stuff. All right, so, let's start with this. When I was a kid, we used to play this game called Simon Says. Right? Most of us have played that, unless you're really young, because there's no app for it. it, it Simon Says is, uh, you know, you just, Simon Says, pat your head, you know, so, okay, you know, Simon said it. Um, it's just, it was a very simple game, but it's so weird how in the church, Jesus Says is a totally different game. If Jesus says something, you don't have to do it, you just have to memorize it. <laughs> You, 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 you study it, you memorize it. You guys, it, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of the things we do, when he tells us to go out and make disciples, and how many people in the, our churches are actually making disciples? They memorized it. You know, when I tell my daughter, hey, hey Rach, go clean your room. She doesn't come back to me two hours later and go, I memorized what you said. <laughs> you said, Rach, go clean your room. I can say it in Greek. <laughs> my friends are going to come over and we're going to have a study on what it would look like if I cleaned my room. <laughs> she knows better than that. And so why do we think we're going to come before the judge one day and quote everything that he said? About how much we know. It's just, it's just this black and white stuff. If I just started with scripture, I'd go, here's what I would do. I'd start making disciples. So, to make a disciple, you have to be a disciple. Right? You can't make something um, that you're not. Right? And um, I've, um, I've often said that, that at seminary, right, you go to the seminary, to learn to be a pastor, but you're taught by seminary professors, right? And so, um, so and, and some of those seminary professors have been pastors, uh, uh, some have not. Um, some of them have gone right into, they've, they graduated from the seminary, uh, just kept on going, got their doctorate, and now they're, they're a seminary professor. And, um, and, and I, I kind of got the feeling, at least for me, and, and I, I may have just done seminary wrong, okay? Um, but when I got out of it, I felt like I was trained pretty well as a seminary professor, but maybe not so much as a pastor. And, um, and, and so then we, you know, we, we, train, uh, we train pastors in a classroom, and then uh, we send them out. And so what do they do? They, they set up classrooms. And they, um, and, and then... They, they train with the training that they've received. And so, basically we sort of make seminary professors. And, um, 
And well, I mean, I, I was just having a talk with Pastor Volker today about just the value of our of our seminary education and how valuable it was. And it's just, I mean, we learned so much, and it was so um, so helpful in uh, avoiding a lot of the traps um, that that you could fall into if you if you just if you don't have that theological background as a pastor. Um, but, and, and, and how often we've, we've seen, you know, people fall into those traps because they don't have the training. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, when I look at the, the methodology that's used, I think there's got to be a better way. And, um, and then I think, well, how would Jesus do it? Because, you know, he's a pretty smart guy and uh, knew a bit about how the church is supposed to work. And um, that's not how he worked. Uh, I mean, he did lecture, you know, Sermon on the Mount kind of stuff, right? But then, even then, he would, you know, he'd speak to the crowds and then he'd pull his disciples aside and he'd talk to them um, privately. And, um, and, and the way that the discipleship worked uh, back then was a rabbi says, hey, come and follow me. And you follow him around and, and um, it wasn't necessarily always, you know, 24-7, but you'd spend significant amounts of time following him around. And, and I always said that really the best, once I realized this process, I realized that the, um, you know, if, if you want to look at, at, at a model to see what it actually looks like, um, uh, you could point to the, the the apprenticeship program, which we don't see as much nowadays. Um, there's still some of that in, in some of the trades. Um, but uh, the best example that I've been able to find is Yoda in Star Wars. <laughs> um, where, you know, he, he teaches, but it's it's this sort of hands-on teaching and, and, um, and, and then, you know, try it up, oh, you know, yeah, you failed. All right. Well, let's keep working at it and, and keep learning and and stuff. And um, and and so it was just this sort of learning by experience, hands on. Right. And so um, so I mean, just the very fact that I'm lecturing tonight, <laughs> that you know, I, I don't consider hypocrisy. You know, there is a, a time for for that kind of teaching, um, but it can't be just that. And but um, so we're going to look at a whole bunch of different things tonight that connect with that, because ultimately, and I said this, I think the first night, um, the goal is not to make converts. The goal is to make disciples. And there's a difference. All right. Um, Because it's not just that that we want to get people to heaven. We want them to know Jesus now. and, And we want them to to know who he is. And, and the ramifications of having him in their life today. Not just, I, I know I'm gonna you know, dodge hell. So, um, we've talked about this before, about uh, be ready to give an answer for the reason, for the hope that's within you, for those who ask, All right? Well, how do you be ready? I mean, it's one thing to say, be ready. <laughs> okay, well, how do I do that? All right? And, um, and the first thing is love and compassion. Um, you know, Paul talks about, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, which is often used in, um, in uh, weddings, love is patient, love is kind. All right, so the word there that's... Uh, that's translated love. Uh, English is a terrible language for this because we, we say love for like, um, whether it's a, a mother and child, uh, whether it's a husband and wife, or whether it's pancakes, right? <laughs> and um, and, and so, so Greek actually has different words for this. Uh, if you're interested, uh, C.S. Lewis does a wonderful job of explaining it all in his book, The Four Loves. Um, but um, 
the, the word that, that is used here is uh, the Greek word keratos, where we get, get the word charity from. Um, and, and sometimes it's translated grace. Um, I've often said that, that you can actually take 1 Corinthians 13, wherever you see love, and replace it with Jesus, and it works, because God is love. Um, but he says the greatest of these is love. Uh, and it's, and it's not, he's not talking about uh, sort of marital, um, you know, romantic love. He's talking about compassion. And, um, and, and so you have to start there. Now, if you're not there, we'll get you there, right? And we'll show you how to get there. Because sometimes it's easy to get jaded. Um, I mean, I even find in myself, in my years of pastoring, that I'm not quite as empathetic as I used to be. Um, and, and that bothers me. And, um, and so I, I have to keep on diving back into the scriptures. I have to keep on praying that because... Um, it just like bad experiences with with different things can can affect um, the the love and compassion within you. Um, but I always have to look back to Jesus, All right? And so the um, so then the the trick in in understanding this is recognizing the fruit of the Spirit that God gives to us, and um, and and understanding that it's not all right so the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience goodness kindness faithfulness gentleness and self-control and and it's easy to rattle those off like i just did right without really thinking about them right and you look at the list and you go well yeah that all sounds good you know paul says against such things there is no law and you go of course not why would there be those are all good things right but the purpose of those those that is not a law all right. Those things are a byproduct of God's grace. All right? So where does love come from when it's when you have love for others? Where does that come from? From the love that God has shown to you. And that does not mean that you're obligated to show that love, but rather that love naturally flows. Oh, wow. God loves me. That's amazing that God loves me. God knows me. I mean, there's things about myself that I don't want anyone else to know. All right? Now, no scandalous, deep, dark secrets or anything like that. But you know what? There's thoughts that go through my mind that I'm not proud of. All right? I would not want a billboard somewhere that always displays my thoughts, whatever's going through my head. All right? And I don't think anybody would. And yet, God knows all of that. He knows every terrible, reprehensible thought that's ever gone through my head, and he still loves me. He's not disgusted with me. That's amazing. And he says, and that love is for everybody. Hey, you guys, you got to get in on this love. This is amazing. Hey, check this out. This is awesome. Right? Joy. Where does joy come from? Knowing God's love. This is great. And, and joy is infectious. And when I have joy, I want others to have joy too. Right? If I am joyful and I see somebody who is not, all right, I mean, this is just natural within us that... that we, we, we want to cheer people up. Now, sometimes, we, you know, we sort of go overboard where, um, where we, we go, well, look on the bright side, when really they just need someone that's going to be, you know, sympathetic and, you know, and, and be a listening ear and stuff like that. So we actually take it too far, but it, it demonstrates that, yeah, joy is, joy is designed to be shared, right? All these things are to be shared. They're, they're best experienced shared. Right, just sitting around thinking about God's love and not sharing it with others, you're not getting the full effect. 
And in fact, um, I, I, you know, thinking about this a few years ago, it, it occurred to me that you know when we when we think about heaven, um, that we we tend to to think of of heaven as sort of um, you know a, a eternal Caribbean vacation, or at least it's the picture that I get in my head. All right, especially in March, all right, in Minnesota, but um, but that's really not the biblical picture, because we see rest and we immediately think Caribbean vacation, all right. But when you really start to look at rest, the way that um, that the Bible talks about rest, it's not so much about you know putting your feet up, as it is having peace, being whole being complete and, and having all that you need, which is why in Hebrews it says that Jesus is our rest. Because he gives us everything we need. It doesn't mean put your feet up. All right? And so, so then it also, because I was thinking about this and I thought, all right, so God's teaching us how to love, which love is ultimately sacrificial living. You know, Paul says in, in Romans 12, um, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Right? So, if, if God is, is teaching us to love, to, to give of ourselves for others, and, and that, that ultimately that is the goal, is, is to, to get to that point, where, and, I mean, we're never at that point, but, but that, that journey toward in that direction, at least, all right, of, of learning to experience the joy of giving to others, serving others in, in, in all things, right? And so, so that's, and, and, and why is God doing that? Because that's how God is, right? And he's saying, here, be like me because it's great to be me, right? And I get, I get how things work best. And so when we, um, when, when we learn to experience love in both the receiving and the giving, then we get to experience the fullness of God's love. Right? And so the more we experience that, the better. Okay, so if God is, is, is training us to experience love in that way, and, you know, and when you think about the opportunities that we have to, to really just give of ourselves to help somebody out and, and you know and they really appreciate it and it feels so good and stuff and of course it feels good that God made us to be that we were made in his image right and so so if so I think boy that that's awesome and then when you think about if heaven is not is all in receiving and not giving and is not serving then we're actually missing out Right? And I do not believe that heaven is about missing out. And so it occurred to me that it just doesn't make sense that love, the, 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 the giving of love and, and just giving of ourselves, sacrificing for others, would end in eternity. And then I thought, is that heresy? Because I've never heard that before. <laughs> and um, you know, anytime you come up with a theological something that, that you've never heard before and you know haven't seen anywhere, it's probably heresy. Because I mean, the idea that you thought of something that two thousand years of theologians didn't—it's um, pretty arrogant. Well, then I was reading Revelation, and I see standing before the throne. They're serving God day and night. Oh, they're serving before God's throne. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, all right. It's always nice when the Bible coincides with your theology. <laughs> right? And, and in fact, um, you know, I, I had that, that realization before I came here to St. James, and then, and then once I was here, I was listening to Pastor Stadler preach one time, and he said precisely that. And I went... Oh, good, it's not just me. <laughs> and, um, and, and so, so then I realized, well, no, I may not have ever heard it before, but I'm certainly not the only one that has drawn this conclusion. And, um, and in fact, I've also seen uh, references to it in Luther and, and other places since then. So, okay, I'm on good ground here, right? 
So then back to the fruit of the Spirit, we see this love, joy, you know, peace. We have peace and that, that wholeness of, of knowing um, that, that God is providing for all our needs and, and, and he's there for us and, and um, you know, just all the blessings that we have that, that no matter what strife we face, that, that we can have this, this peace even in the midst of, of conflict, of, of knowing um, that, that in Christ we are, we are whole. Whatever conflict we have is temporary and he's going to carry us through it. Right? And you can, so you can go right down the line and see that each one of these is, it is the fruit. It, the fruit is what is produced. All right? It's not a command. It's what God does in us. And it's not, and it, I mean, like a tree cannot expend effort to produce fruit. It just naturally does because it is its nature. Right? And so when the Holy Spirit is in us, then he produces this fruit through the gospel. So if you have a tree and you want it to produce fruit, which really, you just want the tree to be healthy. If the tree is healthy, it'll produce fruit. Right? So, so actually, the, the part of the problem is, is, is when we go, okay, well, I want to focus on this fruit. No. No, you can't, if you, if, you, if you have a tree, you say, I'm just going to try and get it to produce fruit. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prune it and, and, and all this kind of stuff, but I'm not actually going to make sure it's healthy. It's not going to work, right? And a lot of the problems we run into with, um, with outrage, evangelism, whatever term you want to use, is that we tend to focus on the fruit and not the health of the tree. And... Um, and so this, you know, gets back to that it's the, yes, the, the fruit is a, is a byproduct of the work that God does in us. So then you have to get back to, all right, so how do you get the tree healthy? <clears throat> it's hard to fill from an empty bucket. Right? There's, and, and I, am, I am the chief of sinners on this one. Right, it is so. Um, it it is it is so tempting to to see there's so much need to serve and to serve and to serve and not to to receive to love but not receive love. Right, and. This is why the burnout rate is so high among pastors. But it's also why the burnout rate can be high among volunteers in church. Because if you're constantly pouring into others and not actually getting filled, then you're going to run out. You're going to get exhausted. Right? And that's, I mean, that's the difference. I mean, because, you know, some people you talk about, oh, we're going to be working and serving and giving of ourselves in eternity. They go, that sounds terrible. I don't know. But there, it'll all be joy. You run and not grow weary and walk and not be faint. You know, I, um, I, I have a, a friend up in, in Canada that is a very talented musician. And... Um, <clears throat> And he's he's written some musical pieces for me that I needed for for various things and and um, said why don't you do this for a living? I mean you're really good. He says because if this were my career, then I'd have to do it. I'd have deadlines and you know I'd I'd, I'd have to do what other people want me to do and and you know and stuff. This I get to do just because I enjoy it. When you take a look at, at what God is, is offering to us and, and to, to understand what does that look like, we go back to the Garden of Eden where God had Adam and Eve tending the garden before the fall. But it was paradise. Paradise. They were taking care of the garden. They had a job to do. But it was all joy. 
And so whether it's, you know, I, and I think about the, the things that I enjoy doing, right? Um, and, and, the, and a lot of the things that I enjoy doing help other people. But you know what? I can get exhausted. So imagine being able to do those things without getting exhausted. Well, how's that, how, how does that work? And now I'm not going to get into sort of the physics and biology of eternity, right? But what I see and what God has presented with us and when, when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God is like, right, which applies not just to eternity but today. And in fact, when you look at all the parables where Jesus says the kingdom of God is like, usually he's talking about this world. Um, but, but at the same time, you can't separate them because there's no, there's no we see a disconnect between um, time and eternity. For him, there's no disconnect. And so, it, you know, take a fresh look at those passages and, and realize that he's talking about both in, in various ways. And it's a fresh look. But, all right, in eternity, imagine we're, we're in, in constant, we, for one, we don't have sin, right? And we don't have the effects of sin that are wearing us out. Right? But at the same time, we're getting constantly filled because we, we see the face of God. Right? We're experiencing that love from him in a way that we, that we can't imagine now. Right? But also, we're being served by all the multitude around us. We're all serving each other. Right? And so we're constantly being filled by everyone else. Everyone is, is filling each other up with God's love. And so it's never depleted. It's overflowing. This is what David says in Psalm 23. My cup overflows. All right, and so, so then, well, we're not in eternity yet, and um, we still have some roadblocks there. So, all right, what do we do about getting that cup overflowing now? And, and so I, I, I love this was explained to me that, um, that when you read the Bible, all right, um, there's, there's exegesis and there's eisegesis, all right? Ex, out of, all right? What do you get out of the Bible? Versus eisegesis, uh, not, not Jesus, Jesus. Um, what are you putting into it, all right? So... So eisegesis is, all right, I've come to a conclusion, and now I need to find biblical passages to support that conclusion. Or I want to make a, I'm doing a sermon on this topic, and so I need to find passages now that, you know, that support that or whatever, all right? Um, and, or you might just say reading into it, all right? Now, there's nothing wrong with, I came to this, and I mean, in fact, I said earlier, I, I came to this conclusion, and then I had a, you know, check the Bible to see if I was right. Okay, that's what we call scripture interprets scripture, and um, you know, and 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 the, that's uh, and also the the other uh, theological term for that is the ministerial use of reason. That God gave us our reason, all right, but our reason is a servant of the scriptures, all right. Magisterial use of reason is I am Lord over the scriptures. I dictate what the scriptures are to say, all right. And so, um, so I, I, even when I'm when I'm writing a sermon, um, generally when I approach the scriptures, uh, what I want to do is is study it, and and you know ask questions of the passage basically, and and find the answers in the text. And so, like when you hear a sermon, if you go, "Wow, I never thought of that before," um, that's probably because what I'm telling you, I never thought of before until I started studying that text that time. Um, so I always like to learn something new. Uh, when I'm preaching, and um, and so so if 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 it's all um, you know if if you, if you hear a sermon you go uh, yeah I've heard all that before you are a step ahead of me. Okay. <laughs> all right. So um, <clears throat> all right. So uh, Hebrews chapter ten. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. All right. So it's, first of all, it's letting the word speak to you. 
right? Letting God tell you what he has to say to you, even if it's not what you want to hear. And in fact, oftentimes I find that when, that when I read a text, if I go into it with a lot of presuppositions, I hear what I want to hear. But then if I read it a few more times and go, okay, am I reading into it? What comes out of it? What happens is the word reads me. And all of a sudden I see things that I don't want to hear. You know, oh, wait a minute, now you're getting personal, God. <laughs> now you're meddling. <laughs> right? Um, but then... When, when you get to that point, keep reading. Read it again. And, and eventually, what I find is that, that okay, first you, you sort of go down into the valley and go, wow, this, this hits really close to home. I'm a mess. All right? And then you keep going with it, and then you find God's grace in it. And going, yeah, even though I'm a mess, um, wow, this is the amazing love of God. It's basically the whole season of Lent <laughs> is designed for that purpose. Okay. Um, so when you read it, first of all, what is God telling you? All right? What is God honestly telling you? And, and so that's why the other thing is always approach Scripture in prayer and, and ask God to, to speak to you and tell you what he, um, what he has to say and what he wants you to hear, right? And be open to that. And then, how does this change your life? Right? How, now that I've read this, and it's, and, and sometimes the way that it changes your life is I'm looking at God in a new way that I've never looked at him before. Right? In fact, usually that's kind of the goal is being able to look at God in, in a fresh new way. Which, I mean, it's not like you're going to have a huge breakthrough every time you crack open a Bible, right? But, um, but it's an ongoing process, and, and sometimes it's just something little. Um, you know, some, and sometimes you read it, and, and you go, not getting anything today, right? And yet, at the same time, I have found that I've, there, I, I mean, today, Yesterday, I read a passage. Uh, yeah, okay. And then today, I was talking to somebody, and what I read yesterday came to mind, and oh, I was just reading this yesterday. I have to tell you, this specifically addresses what you're, what you're dealing with. So, but another... Sometimes I um, simplify this as, what is God telling you? What are you going to do about it? Right? But it's more than that. It's, it's, it's not just what are you going to do about it, but what are, you, what are you seeing that's new? Now, oftentimes, it will lead you to do something about it. All right? um, and that can be kind of scary sometimes. Uh, a friend who, um, uh, who's a pastor was talking to a woman one time and and laid out the gospel to her, and she said, um, you know, everything you said makes total sense. And, um, and I, I get it. I get what you're saying. And, uh, and I can't, I mean, I can't argue with you. It, it all sounds right. So okay. She says, but I can't believe it. Why not? She said, because if what you say is true, then that means that my life has to change. And that I cannot live the way that I live right now. It would be completely inconsistent. I don't want my life to change. And so therefore, I cannot allow myself to believe what you've just told me. So, so God shows us his great love for us. He says, but what I have for you is so much more. And
and um, and and that's the other thing is that being a disciple and growing in faith is not about the actions. It's not about changing the way you live. It's about changing how you see God. And only he can do that in you. And when you change, when, when that changes, it changes the way you live. It gets back to what I was saying about the fruit of the spirit. It's a byproduct of faith. Right? When you, and, and this is, when you read James and, and he talks about faith without works is dead. He's, he's not saying better get to work or, you know, or, or you don't, you know, I, I question your faith, but rather he's saying, look, <clears throat> faith just naturally produces good works because you recognize the joy of it, the beauty of it. Um, in uh, the sort of uh, early-ish years of the Reformation, um, not right away, but kind of after people were starting to really think about all this different stuff, they said, so are good works necessary for salvation? And, and they, they debated and studied it and stuff, and ultimately they said, yes. Not that good works save you, but that faith is necessary for salvation, and faith will naturally produce good works. The same way that when you make cheese, you're going to get whey. It just happens. Right? And, um, and, and so, so you, can't, you can't hang your salvation on your works. But you, you can't, you, it's, there's, there's an expectation there. Not an obligation, but an expectation just because of the nature of faith that it will produce works. And it's not something that you can, you know, it, it, we're so good at putting the cart before the horse, um, and you can't do that. Because you just completely mess it up. Works do not, faith does not follow works, works always follow faith. All right. <clears throat> but the other thing is faith is collective. And that's this, um, this Hebrews passage is that God designed faith to be shared. Now, no one can believe for you, right? But faith is designed because God is a plural singularity. He's the Trinity. He is in and of himself a relationship. Right? And we are designed in his image. We were designed... I mean... All right, so... God is, is one God and three persons. He creates man in his image, and then he says, it's not good for man to be alone. Why not? Because we were made in God's image, and God is community. And so, because we were made in God's image, faith is intended to be shared. Faith is intended to, to be, it it's builds itself up through community, through people being in the scriptures together, right? Through growing in faith together, right? And that's why I always get concerned when people drift away from their from their church, from their their Christian friends or whatever, um, because it's so hard on faith. It puts such a strain on faith doesn't mean that if they drift away, they don't have faith. But it puts a huge strain on it. Because then you don't have each other to build each other up. And, um, and, and why would you want to create that hardship for yourself? Why would you want to make things difficult for yourself? <clears throat> so... When you see God at work, point him out. Right? This is a matter of, of opening your eyes. Maybe it's a matter of, of every day saying, God, let me see you working. And and sometimes you see something where you go, wow, that was kind of miraculous. 
Sometimes you go, wow, that was an incredible coincidence. And I'm not saying that every coincidence is God performing a miracle. Right? But if you see God in it, don't say that, don't think that he's, he can't be. Right? I used to, with coincidences, I used to kind of go, ah, I'm, I'm just going to be inherently skeptical of coincidences as far as it being, you know, something divine. But then I came to the realization that, you know what, to, to dismiss God and say, no, there's no way this was God, that's not really being fair either because God has his hand in everything. And so ultimately, in, in anything, I can go, well, that was God. Was it, was it God sort of, you know, flipping the die or, or whatever, you know? Or, uh, or was it God working hundreds of years ago to move things in different directions to cause things to end up the way they are today? You know, I, I don't know. But I see God's fingerprints all over the place. Right? And here's the other thing. We have a tendency to go, hey, this really good thing happened to me. I found some money that I didn't know I had or, you know, or, or something like that. And, and, and praise God for that. I'm so blessed. And yeah, absolutely. All right? But what about the suffering? When things don't turn out the way we want them to, how often do we praise God for that? How often do we look for God in the suffering? And yet, Jesus was pretty clear. In this world, you'll have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Right? We look to the cross, we see suffering. Right? And, <clears throat> and when he says, if you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. Right? What he's saying there is, is lift up the cross, lift up our cross is Christ's cross. We don't have to carry our cross. We lift, up, we lift, the, lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim. Right? But you know what? That's not always easy. And so, do we look for God in the suffering? And oftentimes you see God more clearly in the suffering than you do in the celebrations. And uh, in fact, Luther said the marks of the theologian are oratio, meditatio, and tentatio. Right? Because you've got to do everything in Latin. Right? This is prayer, meditating on God's word, and suffering. Right? Suffering, suffering is, is part of Christian life. And it's where we find God. And so, and, 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 and yet, when we find God in the suffering, that's where you find the greatest peace. Um, because when we find God in, in the celebrations, that peace can be very fleeting. As soon as the celebration's done, now I'm not blessed anymore. But when we can find God in the suffering, then even if things get better, he's still there. Uh, next thing is exercise. Right? Um, take what you've been given and use it. Okay. You know, one way to put this is teachers learn more in teaching than the students, <clears throat> right? Um, I find that the more challenging, the, like the time that I, in my life, that I grew the most in my faith was a time of intense suffering, right? In fact, as I think back on all the times in my life where I've grown the most in faith, where I felt closest to God, 
where I've just like experienced his presence with me were times of prolonged, intense suffering. In fact, when I was at a conference a couple years ago, and, um, and the, the speaker says, so I want you to think back on a time where you just were, like you and God were just connecting and, and where you just, like you were just super close and, and, and you were experiencing that and, and stuff. And, and I, you know, immediately something came to mind and, and then and I thought about it. I thought, but that was a, and I mean, honestly, I don't even remember what the rest of the presentation was. Uh, she opened with that, and then I was down a mental rabbit hole. I mean, I, I heard the rest of it, and it was good. I just can't remember it now. I'd have to go back. I have notes um, that I could refer back to. But, but what I remember was, was that, because then I thought, you know, I miss that. I miss that connection, that, that, that closeness. Why don't I have that now? And it's not that I don't, you know, feel close to God or anything like that. But there was, like, that was a specifically, especially intense time of, of, of closeness with God. And I realized, because that was a time of really intense suffering. A time where I was, I was questioning myself and, and I was trying to do the right thing. And I was experiencing a lot of pressure to, to just to cave and, and stuff. And, and, and God was there and he was strengthening me and building me up and encouraging me to keep on going. And, and I thought, okay, so why can't I have that now? <clears throat> oh, because I'm not going through that level of suffering right now. Right. Um, but I do find that the more, where, the, the more challenged I am, in sharing the gospel with people that are struggling, the more it strengthens me. It also, it, it does empty my bucket, all right? Which forces me back to the scriptures again and again to get refilled, which forces me into prayer. And just like physical exercise, that's faith exercise. And so, so just putting yourself in situations, not where you're tempted to sin, all right, but where you're going to be challenged, as long as you remember that when you find yourself suddenly empty or suddenly without the answers or, with the, you know, or whatever, and, and all of a sudden that you hit a roadblock, that you know, all right, it's time to get refilled. It's time to say, you know, when someone asks that question that you can't answer and you say, I don't know, I need to go get a refill. And it means going back to the scriptures and going back to the church, the body of Christ, the collective body that's going to build you up. That you don't have to find all the answers yourself. And I find the more I experience that challenge, the more I grow. Right? There's so many things that I never would have thought of until somebody came along and said, well, what about that? Good question. I don't know. And sometimes I found that because God works in us and through what, we, what he has already put in us through his word, that somebody will ask me a question and I'll go, oh, here's the answer. And then I'll give them the answer and I'll go, oh, yeah, that's right. I've never thought of that. I have no, I don't know where that, well, I do know where that came from, but it wasn't me. <laughs> and, and that's all about getting filled up. And, um, and because here's the thing, if you're, if you're constantly consuming God's word, right, it's good. But if you're not actually exercising, what happens when you keep consuming, but you don't exercise? <laughs> All right? Spiritual obesity. <laughs> right? You know, all this good stuff, and you can just kind of sit and wallow in it. Right? But it's not really healthy. Your, um, your camera stopped. Uh, 
I, I thought it might. The, the internet down here is kind of wonky, so um, I've, I've got my backup camera going, so. <laughs> All right, um, and all right. So this is back when um, a, a number, uh, oh, probably about um, six years ago. Um, I was, and this was in some of that really intense time. Um, I found myself I asked this question: Number one, what is a disciple? And you go, oh, well, textbook answer: follower of Jesus. Okay. And then I I read the Great Commission, and I saw that Jesus said, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, check. And teaching them to to keep, to observe, NIV translates to obey, it's not a good translation, to, to treasure everything that I've commanded you. And and I realized that the way that I had always read that passage was teaching them everything I've commanded you. And, and mentally, I was skipping over the to observe, to treasure part. And so my thought was, oh, I can just teach this stuff. I can convey information, and I'm doing my job. <clears throat> And then I realized, no, that's not what it says. I'm reading into it. What it says is teaching them to try. It's the same word where it says, and Mary kept all these things and and pondered them in her heart. It's kept to treasure, to, 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 to just, yes, this. Right. So I'm like, okay, I know how to teach everything he commanded. I don't know how to teach to treasure how do I do that? And, and it was a real, um, it was a crisis for me because here I've been a pastor for over a decade and I realized that I didn't know how to make disciples. Uh, well, isn't that sort of job one? Of what have I been doing for the past decade? And then I went, wait a minute, I know how to make disciples. Or at least I know I've done it because I look at in my own home and I look at my kids. And if you know my daughters, they love Jesus. They want everybody else to know Jesus. I mean, they are disciples of Jesus Christ. I mean, and I went, oh, well, how did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I realized that, I mean, in our family, um, I didn't grow up with it, and so it wasn't a habit for me, that sort of uh, daily devotion, kind of sit down and, you know, and have a little worship time or, or things like that. We just, that just was never part of, of our family culture. Yeah. So what what do we do? Oh, well, I mean, we just, it was just that the, the Christian faith was just integrated into our whole lives. Everything that happened, we just saw it through that lens, and we taught the kids to see it through that lens. And But it was still sort of like, okay, how, how do you, I, I, I've still, that, okay, that, that's part of it. And then I, I was talking to my daughter Hannah uh, um, a couple months ago about this and, um, and, and I said you know I, I'm, I'm going to teach other people how to do this but I, I'm, I'm still not entirely sure how I did it and, and you know sort of what what's the, the secret I don't, I don't know and, and, and she says dad you and mom gave us opportunities to love You know, we, we did foster care and, and, and adoption and, and, and we, wherever we saw a need, using the resources that God had, give, had given to us, we, we used those resources to help people. Not all the time, right? not, <laughs> right? But when we saw opportunities, we enjoyed serving and, and so we did. 
And, um, and we taught the kids to do that and showed them the joy of it. And, and I realized, oh, 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 well, we taught you how to exercise, <laughs> right? Which led to all kinds of interesting things like when my oldest, I caught her at 11 o'clock at night talking to atheists on Facebook and sharing the gospel with them and she hadn't done her homework yet. <laughs> and end up having to ground my daughter for doing evangelism instead of her homework. She was not happy about that. No. Dad, this goes against everything you've ever taught us. <laughs> yes, but those opportunities will still be there tomorrow. Unless Jesus comes back first. <laughs> It gets really tricky for you as a parent when your kids live sacrificially and and you go, wait, you don't have to do that. Like when um, when Hannah was six years old and got her first quarter from the tooth fairy and she had her, her little Thrivent piggy bank that had different slots in it for uh, save, spend, uh, invest. They got rid of the invest one in, in more recent ones and donate. And when when we got them for them, they we explained to them what the different ones mean. And, and so when she got her um, her quarter for her tooth from the tooth fairy, and she went up to her piggy bank and and she's looking at the different slots and she said, Dad, which one is the one? that's helping other people. And so, well, that's donate. That's where I want to put it. And here, as a, as a parent, I'm going, you don't have to do that. You are not obligated to do that. This is your quarter from the tooth fairy that you can use for whatever you want. She said, but I want to. And then I realized that I was going, why am I trying to talk her out of this? <laughs> she gets it. Um... So, yeah, look for opportunities to love. All right. Um, Think about responding with the love of Christ. Um, the news, uh, social media, nowadays those two are, there's not much, a, there's a pretty fine line between the two. Um, <laughs> or, or maybe I should say a really blurry line between the two. Um, but how to respond with the love of Christ using your toolbox, all right? Just think about uh, trending examples. In, in our house, because um, our, our family are fans of the show When Calls the Heart on the Hallmark Channel, um, and with the, the big college scandal, and Lori Laughlin's one of the, um, the, one of the stars of that show, and, um, and now she's off the show because she's going to prison, um, then, you know, just how do we how do we look at that and, and how do we you know respond to that and, and, and talk about that and, and there's you know when you, we started really looking into it um, and realizing that they they faked handicaps um, the, some of the people involved to um, to get special privileges so that people with real handicaps not only missed out but um, but that it's going to cause more scrutiny. And, and it's already hard for, for people with disabilities to get the, the special uh, allowances that they need. Now it's gonna be even harder because they're gonna scrutinize even more. And you know, and, and that can make it really easy to go, this is, oh, you're so mad, right? And so then how do we take that to the cross? How do, how do you look at that and then and start to recognize I think about them as parents and, and looking at my, my kid is never getting to get into college because they're totally spoiled. But I, I know that this is what I want for them. And so they end up taking um, shortcuts and actually making it worse right, by bribing their way into the school. But I also, when you start to look through the eyes of of those parents trying to figure out, trying to clean up the mess that they've created because they really do love their kids and want the best for them. That then you 
you start to look at that and go, they need Jesus. They need, they need all of those things in God's toolbox. But you can't just give them those. They need Jesus because that's where it comes from. Because once you have those things, then you don't need that other stuff. Or that, you know, or there's, there's ways to, to, to sort of see where you're at and get to where you hope to be. That's not taking the easy or illegal way, but rather to, you know, to, to have the body of Christ around you to, um, to be there for you, to help you navigate through all of these things. I have a really hard time watching the news because it's so depressing. <laughs> But to, to watch the news or, you know, other kinds of media and that you can actually take it and, and turn it into a prayer list. And, and to look at a situation instead of saying, oh, those terrible people, all right? Say, all right, God, they need Jesus. How do I need to pray for them? To, so that they can have what I have. And, and to just to sit and watch the news or, you know, or, or read the articles as they pop up or however you get your, you know, your media, um, to look at it from that perspective. And then when you find yourself sort of at the water cooler and having those discussions with people because these, um, you know, these big stories, they become the, what everybody's talking about. When you can bring grace into that and say, you know, I, here's how I look at it. I, you know, I was thinking about it and I was thinking about what would motivate a person to do that or, you know, or whatever. And, and I think about how miserable do you have to be to, to put yourself, you know, to do something like that or, or whatever. And, and where do you go from here? And, and to be able to, to communicate grace into that conversation, um, I, I found that, that now sometimes there's, like, when you, when you speak grace and everyone else is talking vengeance, they don't want to hear grace. <laughs> No, this is bad. Now, understand this. This is some of this conversation that Pastor Stadler and I had um, a couple months ago. That, that he said, you know, one of the one of the early mistakes that I made uh, in my ministry was to um, to jump immediately to forgiveness and skip the outrage. And he said there is a time and a place for outrage. And and don't be too quick to jump to forgiveness. All right. And so the idea is that. Um, that until you, like, first, for one, if, if someone has been sinned against, if someone has been violated in some way, right, that you need to be there with them in their pain and, and say, yeah, this is terrible. You're right. This, this should not have happened. This is the thing that should not be. Right? And to not make light of it. And then, once they've established, and, and this is not something that you do in five minutes, right? This is something that can take days or years, right? Um, but once they know that they're not alone in their pain, then you can help to, to lead them to peace and in peace can find forgiveness. And, um, and that's freeing. And so, so yeah, with, you know, with, it, it, so this can be, you know, this can be the, the sort of the easy sort of technique, right, is to, um, to just take these, these stories and stuff that everybody's talking about and say, how do I look at this through the lens of the cross? 
Um, and, <clears throat> and, and also seeing how people react. Um, being sensitive. And so it's not just, it's not just looking at what happened or what the news story is and also recognizing that all news stories are sensationalized. Um, because ultimately what news agencies are about is getting eyes or ears. It's not about as much as they talk about journalistic integrity, right? And I, I, I'm not saying that they don't have it, but ultimately what keeps them in business is not just the facts, because they need to compete. And so you always have to look at it through the lens of bias. You have to look at it through, you know, sort of filter out the sensationalism and stuff. And and because they're trying to they're trying to grab your emotions. And um, you know that's why they go. Oh, this shocking story after the break. <laughs> <laughs> um. And and so, um, I'm running out of time. But uh, did have any of you had uh, an experience like that where um, you've seen things kind of flare up? Um, whether or not you were able to, to bring grace in or things that, that come to mind. Discussion, it, you know, kind of reminds me of the conversations I have with my dad, who watches the news and gets all inflamed by, you know, whatever the whatever the flavor of the day happens to be. And, and I, I guess I just don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't know about being able to bring grace to it. I just. Just sort of like, oh yeah, okay, Dad, yeah, I hear you, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Because <laughs> there's sort of, there's sort of no, it feels like there's no responding to it because it's once, yeah, at least for him, once he gets into the flow of whatever the scandal of the day happens to be, it's just sort of like he's just going to rant on until he runs out of gas. You see something right? Oh, well, I, I have heard him say to his dad, well, you might be right. And also, you know, there might, something else might happen too. Or it might not be, yeah, but he usually starts with, yeah, you might be right. And just to give him that sort of sense of being heard, I think is what you were talking about there. Yeah. To be with someone in their pain. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I just, I was thinking of also that I was walking with some friends and uh, one of them was widowed, you know, just walked into the room holding her grandchild and found her husband dead. And um, one of her best friends shortly after that said, well, you know, this is part of God's plan. And she's still hurting years later because what she needed was someone to say to her, this is so unfair, you guys, you know, had, had you guys had plans? You loved each other. You were. He was younger. He was. He had just retired three weeks earlier. I mean, it was just the worst. And you need to be with someone in that pain. And so I'm learning a lot tonight. I don't know when the disciple part's going to kick in, but I, I think earlier tonight. Well, I'm going to talk to myself. So I'll stop. There. Okay. Anyway, it's really this is a great class for me, and I'm learning a lot. So, a great discussion. You know, one way that's been said to me is, and this is a, where when I was when I was on Vicarage, um, we had uh, kids in my I was teaching fifth and sixth grade confirmation class, and I found out that the assistant principal um, of the middle school had had told uh, had communicated in one way or another to the kids that um, that if they bring their Bibles to school, they'll end up in detention. Really? And I went. Uh, guys, that's illegal. Um, freedom of religion, as long as you know you are being respectful and not like taken out in the middle of class or something, where 
you're supposed to be listening to your teacher or whatever, but if there's, you know, silent reading time or something like that, and, you know, or there's, there's situations, then you absolutely have the right to, to do that. And, um, and, and they're like, well, yeah, but we'll end up in detention, then we'll miss the bus, and, um, and you know, and, and then we'll get in trouble. And I said, if you miss the bus, you call me, I'll come pick you up. And, um, and, and what I forgot to say is, talk to your parents first. <laughs> and um, I got a, well, or rather my supervising pastor <laughs> got a very angry call after her, um, the, her, her twins were on their way to the bus stop or, or like while leaving the house about as they're getting on the bus in the morning on the way to school said, by the way, mom, we might not be on the bus on the way home. <laughs> Oops. And so she found out, you know, what was all going on and, and stuff. And, um, and, and she was really upset. And, and, and I, you know, I, I was sort of, Self-righteous, like no, but this is—I mean—they have the legal right to do this, and it's, it's a great way for them to, you know, to express their their faith in, in a very, uh, you know, simple, non-confrontational kind of way, and and stuff, and um, and but then my my supervising pastor said, "All right, you've got to meet people where they're at. You can't expect where someone is, is you know, just kind of trying to figure this stuff out." And, and figure out what's best for their kids and parenting is hard and you know and, and, and trying to navigate all this stuff and just expect them to all of a sudden leave where you're at. You got to go to them first and in fact you, you look at Jesus and the way Jesus did this over and over again. Um, and he did it beautifully. He goes to this, the woman at the well and um, and, and, and he says, you know, give me a drink. And she says, what are you talking to me? You're, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. What are you, and, um, and, and he says, go get your husband. And, and she's, well, I don't have a husband. No, you've had five husbands and the guy you're living with now is not your husband. And this is interesting, I was just listening to a sermon this week um, and he was talking about this, this passage. And, um, and he says, now notice, all right, if someone, usually that's taken as, his words to her are taken as sort of condemnation of her lifestyle, right? But if someone confronts you and condemns you, you know, calls you out on, on something, what is your reaction? You want to get away from them, you hide your head, or you respond in anger or something like that. What is, what is her reaction? She goes into town and says, you've got to meet this guy, All right? Jesus was reaching out to her in compassion saying, you know, look, you've, I, I see you've been, you've been pushed from, from man to man. You've been, um, you know, your, your life has just been, has been awful and, and desperate. And, I, and I'm, I see you. And I see where you're at. And, and I'm here for you. For that, she goes and says, you've got to meet this guy. He's amazing. He meets her where she's at. He does this over and over again, where people in all kinds of different situations, that he doesn't just say, all right, here's the bar, jump. <laughs> yeah. All right, he says, I'm here for you, all right? I'll take, I'll, I'll jump the bar for you, all right? You just come along. And, and it's, it's over and over again, and I know, I know I've mentioned this in a previous class, but Jesus hung out with all of these people whose lifestyles were in complete conflict with, with God's law. And he went and he talked to them. He didn't compromise his principles one bit, and yet they loved him. If we are communicating God's truth in such a way that people are not reacting with this is wonderful, then we're doing something wrong. If they're just feeling judged, then we're not communicating the gospel. Um, so, yeah, meet people where they're at. And so, so yeah, that's, uh, I like how you, that, you might be right. <laughs> that, may, that may well happen. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. All, all, yeah. Although, although when she when she says it, it sounds good, but when I say it, they <laughs> just sort of like you know pacifying. It was like, yes, dad. Yeah, well, yeah, you might be right. I don't you know. know. But I mean, but it it, it could also you know it, sometimes something like um, what do you think would cause a person to do that? Nobody gets up in the morning and says, I'm just going to be evil today. You know? Yeah. Like, what's, what's motivating them to do that? And, you know, what if, and this is, um, oh, I just heard, it's a, it's, it's a, a fallacy that, that we have that's inherent in our psyche. All right, so, um, so, it was earlier today, um, I was coming down uh, uh, Delaware to turn on to Dodd, and, I, and I'm looking at all the potholes and trying to, you know, weave my way around it. And, and I was so focused on getting around the potholes, I realized after I turned that I forgot to use my turn signal. Now, oh, whoops. And then it occurred to me right after that that if I saw somebody else in that same situation not use their turn signal, you idiot, don't you know what that little lever is on, the, on your steering wheel post? Mm -hmm. Right? Because we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt and we assume the worst of other people. It's ingrained in us. We assume when somebody else does something that, that we disagree with or that is wrong or, or whatever, we assume that it's a reflection of their character. Whereas with ourselves, it's situational. It's because of something happened that caused us to do that. Well, that makes no logical sense. All right? So rather, when someone does something and you think, what a terrible person or what a stupid person, or whatever. Hmm. I wonder what their situation is that caused them to do that. And so sometimes in a you know in a situation like this, you can kind of take it back to that. I wonder what would cause a person to do that. Because I know, like I like to think that I wouldn't do what they did. What would it take to even get me to consider that? Right. Even if I would never do that, what would what what had to be driving that person? And just try to you know, say, well, let's let's just take a look at things through their eyes, not excusing it, right? But let's at least see where they're coming from, because then at least they can help us understand the situation better. The better you understand the situation, the more you can infuse grace into it. Okay, pray. Pray with expectation. James says, this is James chapter one, all right? Right off the bat. Let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. James does not mince words. All right? You ever pray for something and actually get what you asked for and were surprised? Yeah. Yeah. All the time. Okay. All right. Um, we we kind of it's it's so easy to think that like that God's not going to answer our prayers or that He's not going to give us what we want. All right. It's easy to fall into that trap. You go, well, there's all those other times that I prayed for stuff and didn't get what I wanted and. I can't really see how this is going to, you know, work out. Um, and, and so it can be easy to pray in doubt. All right. Now, of course, you can't produce faith in you. Only God can do that. So when you find yourself doubting whether God can come through for you, then it's time to go fill your bucket again. All right. Get back in the Word. Get back in the community of faith. Find people that will help to build you up. <clears throat> and so this means uh, kingdom praying, thinking about all those the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of God is like, um, and, and thinking about, all right, so now praying in the context of 
Christ is with us. He has redeemed our past, present, and future. Um, everything is in his hands. He loves us. He's caring for us. Uh, we can count on him. Um, and, 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 and we're living in his grace. Right? And so with that in mind, you know, think about what Jesus said, ask anything you want of the Father in my name and, and he'll give it to you. And you think, and I think, oh, I've asked lots of things that God didn't give me. Right? Uh, but you're praying in his name. Are you taking it? Are you bringing it through the cross? Or are you circumventing the cross and saying, but God, this is what I want? All right? Or are you taking it through the lens of God's grace, through the lens of everything that is Christ, and going, okay, God, this would be good for your kingdom. Not necessarily this would be good for, for me, not necessarily this would be good for my church, my congregation, but for your kingdom. Right? And thinking in those terms. Now, even in those terms, we have to recognize that there are times where we're not going to understand. We're going to say, God, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this, and this would be good for your kingdom. This would be really great. And, and we ask for it, and he doesn't come through the way that we had hoped. Right? And so in those situations where we say, I will be done, um, part of God's kingdom is recognizing that he's bigger than us. And recognizing that, all right, God, this didn't work out the way that I was expecting, but I'm still going to look for you in the suffering. I'm still going to... And I'm, I'm going to take this to you and count on you. And, um, and it always takes me back to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed that, where, where he was saying, Thy will be done, when he knew that God's will was for him to suffer terrible abuse within the next, um, I don't know, you know, 12, 16 hours, whatever. Unimaginable abuse that he would be nailed to a cross, and the pain is literally where we get the word excruciating from. It means from the cross. Okay. And that on the cross, that he was going to be abandoned by the Father. That God would turn his face of favor away from him, so that he would find himself crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knew that was coming. He knew that he was going to be abandoned by God, something that God would never do to any other human being. Never has, never will. He knew that's what was coming, and yet he prayed, thy will be done. And so kingdom praying means, all right, God, I, I don't get this. I don't, you know, I don't always understand how this works, but I'm putting it in your hands. Because, you know what, it worked out pretty well in his case. All right? And so, God, I don't see how you can fix this. I don't see how you can bring good out of this for your God. And so I'm going to trust you. Don't give up. All right, see, pray without ceasing. Um, you know, over and over. There's been oh, so many situations where, where I did give up and God came through anyway. Um, there's plenty of situations where I find myself going, God, it seems like it's time to give up. But you've surprised me so many times before. And why am I surprised when I am dealing with the all-powerful God of the universe? So yeah, the, the people that you're concerned about. Pray for them. And don't give up praying for them. Make reminders for to pray. Um, what works for you? Now, I, I confess that this is an expression of my weakness, right? That I need these reminders. 
um, because I get so busy trying to fill other people's buckets, right? This is the reason I wear these bracelets on my arm, because each one of them is a reminder to pray for something different. Um, and so I wear them so that when I see them, I'll remember I need to take a moment to pray. Um, just down on the bottom left, that's a screenshot from my phone. Every morning at 7.55 a.m., this reminder pops up, pray for the opportunity to connect with someone with Christ's love today. And it's a reminder for me to just stop and say, God, this is your day. And so I don't know what you have planned today, but if there is somebody out there that you are going to bring into my life so that I can show them the love of Christ, make me open to that. Make me aware of it. Help me to see that. Right? That's my daily reminder to stop and it helps me have perspective on the day. Right? And, um, and, it, and it just it reminds me of what my day is all about. And I'll tell you, there have been so many times where I've said, um, God, I, I'm planning on sitting home all day today. And I'm not expecting to have a whole lot of human interaction today, except for with my family. And um, so if you got plans, great, but I'm not seeing it. But, you know, whatever. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden that text comes in from one of the youth that's struggling. You know, or, or sometimes something it's in my own family where something comes up. Huh. Well, God, you're bigger than my plans. <laughs> right? But it's that praying for that. God, keep me open to this. Keep my eyes open and, um, and, and help me. Um, this other is a, is a screenshot of an a app that I use on my phone called Prayer Mate. It's a free app. Um, and, uh, and you can, when someone says, tells you something and, um, you know, a struggle or whatever it is, and you say, I'll pray for you, you actually put it in this app and then you can, it has ways where you can, if, you, if there's certain things you want to pray, you know, weekly for certain things, daily for other things, uh, you can categorize things where like I've got it set up so that, um, you know, uh, of, of all my family, um, I pray for five of them each day. And, um, or each time that I open the app. Sometimes once a day, sometimes twice a day. Some days I'm too busy filling buckets and I don't take the time when I should. When, and, and so many days that I don't and I regret it. Right? Um, but it's so that, so that when you say I'll pray for you, that it reminds you to actually do it. Just take a moment, add their name um, to, to make sure that when you do take that time. And it also, I like that it also has, you can set up a little reminder like alarms so that it'll, a couple times a day, pops up on my phone, time to pray. Yes, it is. Um, and so, so those, are the, <laughs> those are the crutches that I use. Um, as I limp along in my own personal prayer life, um, and um, and and those those will work for some people and not for other people. Figure out what works for you. Um, I I find for me that I, I used to really eschew ritual, and now I found that it's really helpful. Um, like putting the bracelets on in the morning, and and like when I go to put them on, you know, taking that time. Um, when I put my glasses on in the morning, I say, God, help me to see the needs of those around me and respond accordingly. Help me to see your kingdom, your hand in my life and in the lives of others. Um, and, you know, so just like little things like that, um, we sort of set those, those reminders uh, for yourself. Now, if, if, if you're one of those people that, that has this prayer thing, you know, that you're you don't need those reminders, then you're a step ahead of me. And, and that's great. So, um, but if, if you do, you know, just think about what, what works for you. Um, it's a, is it a post-it note on your car dashboard or, um, or a, 
maybe it's it's getting a, a different coffee cup that that says, "Hey, don't forget to pray on it," or you know, whatever it is. Um, so, but I find those little reminders. But um, yeah, boy, there's there's times where um, where I'll go for a short period of time without praying because I'm so busy, and then when I finally get back to it, I realize what I've been missing and, and how completely backwards my priorities have been. And um, this, is, this is a quote from Luther that said, um, that one day he said, boy, I've got, I have so much to do today. I need to spend an extra hour praying. Um, so we kind of talked about this already. Step in their world and look through their eyes. Uh, it's a quote from Neil Cole, who's written a lot on discipleship. You have to be willing to sit in the smoking section when your primary stance is missional. Right? Missional is this whole idea we're talking about. Um, it's the idea of of like just being involved in people's lives, not treating them like a formula, and um, and, and just loving people and and um, waiting for those opportunities. Uh, to share the gospel, and um, and and so now, this is not to offend smokers, right? But the point is to, and and he's not condemning smoking, right? But rather, he's he's saying um, that sometimes you got to step out of your comfort zone and be willing to do that. And in fact, look for opportunities where there's someone outside your comfort zone that needs Christ. Um, otherwise, we end up with a really homogeneous church. And um, you know what? When I look at the descriptions of heaven, and it says every tribe and every tongue is gathered on the throne, I think that's what I want our church to look like. And that means that You've got to, and, and I mean, not just our church, it's what I want. The kingdom of God in Minnesota, you know, or whatever, wherever my personal reach happens to be, and each of our personal reach happens to be, um, <clears throat> that I recognize that um, not everybody is going to, uh, to see the world have the same priorities, have the same ways of approaching things as I do. Right? And, and when you can sit down with a person and say, explain this to me. Um, and, and, you know, where sometimes it means that you've got to go somewhere you wouldn't normally go. You've got to listen to music you wouldn't normally listen to. You know, or whatever it is. And go, okay, so what, is, what, what appeals to you about this? Right? So if you can't see this through their eyes, ask them to help you. Walk with them. Ask questions. Right? And here's the thing. People love talking about themselves. Mm-hmm. And they love talking about what's important to them, right? And so, so the, the first step in this is actually just asking them about themselves, asking them to talk about themselves, to talk about what's important to them and why it's important to them, right? So that you can see where they're coming from. And, and, and when you do that and you listen and you don't, Stop him and go, oh, hold on a minute, that's wrong. Mm-hmm. But you just listen to see where they're coming from. Then they experience God's love because someone cares about them and is listening to them just this, and, and is there spending time with them the same way that the way God expresses his love for us is by being present with us and hearing us and listening to us. That's the way Jesus did. So we get next month, nuts and bolts, mm-hmm. right? But I hope that you see how important all of this stuff is leading up to it. Because you can do it the other way, but it's really hard. If you don't have this, um, you know, you just you end up filling from an empty bucket. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just, it's exhausting and you burn out and, and there's no joy in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just turns into obligation. And then you're completely missing the point.
Right. On your um, on your guides, it's homework. Encourage you to um, to take a look at that. Is anybody from? Um, I forgot to ask at the beginning. Was there anything from last time that, um, that you recall that um, kind of popped out? That <clears throat> there's so this uh, the homework. I just need to grab one of those sheets. Um, if you take a look at these, are some suggestions um, of some things that that you can do. Um, pray the media. I kind of already talked about that. Um, and it's just, you know, the stories, how are you getting your news? Um, you can do it with movies, too. Like dramas and, and things like that, or even sitcoms. Um, sometimes the situation is just so goofy that, you know. But um, but I, I find this is actually why I have a hard time watching some dramas, because they're sort of spiritually exhausting for me, because um, I empathize too much. And just think, they need Jesus. <laughs> um, but to say, how, how would this be different if they knew God's freedom in, in Christ? Um, and then pray for them and ask God whether he's calling you to act. You know, is this a situation where God is calling you to do something? Whether it's, to, whether it's uh, you know, maybe something local where you actually could do something about it, right? Or whether it's um, that when the conversation comes up, at work or you know with your friends or whatever that God is calling you to act to, to bring grace into that conversation um, the Lord's Prayer in a week right so get out your small catechism if you don't have it anymore you can find them online right go to concord.org um, and um, and take find the Lord's Prayer in it all right and look at the explanation that's there and then pray that, that petition of the Lord's Prayer, do one a day. And, um, and you know, think, read the explanation, think about what it means, and then um, pray that petition throughout the day. Just that one, not the whole Lord's Prayer, just that petition. And set reminders for yourself, whatever you gotta do, all right? Um, and then keep your eyes open. Right? If you pray the Lord's Prayer and it doesn't change your life, then you're doing it wrong. Right? Because the Lord's Prayer, um, when we look at, and Luther explains it so beautifully, over and over he says, you know, God's name is indeed holy without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may be kept holy among us also. God, hallowed be your name. Let my life, the way that I interact with people today, Keep your name holy, right? And um, and to, to just with with each of those, and so you can do there's seven petitions, seven days in a week, right? And so so my suggestion here is repeat that for three months, uh, stagger it so you're not so that you do a different so that you're not always doing the first petition on Sunday or Monday or whatever, you know, like just shift it each week by a day or, or something, you know? Um, because you have certain experiences or certain situations always happen on a certain day of the week, right? And, um, and so this will allow you to take that petition and apply it, you know, different petitions and apply it to the same situation. Let's see what happens. Um, and, and, and a lot of people are big fans of journaling and, and I definitely would um, encourage that um, this is something that, that I keep telling myself I need to do and, and I wish I had been doing it and I haven't because um, I'm too busy filling people's buckets, right? Um, but it's an opportunity to, uh, to jot down just especially when you, you know, when you learn something, you experience something. Um, I kind of use Facebook as my journaling. <laughs> so that uh, the beauty of it is though that um, when when you come around a year later, or five years later, whatever, and you get those, um, you know, memories from today. That's why I use it that way. Um, sometimes I post stuff that's only visible to me, just so that it'll come up again in a year. Um, and uh, and prayer walk your neighborhood, right? So this is you walk through your neighborhood, right? This can be 
around where you work, around where you live, you know, a, a random neighborhood, whatever. I mean, you know, be safe. But, um, but uh, so what you do is you you walk on the um, past a house. All right, and you look at that house, and just based on what you see, the yard, whatever. Um, what do you see there? What can you learn about that family or whoever it is that lives in that house, just based on what you see? All right. Maybe there's a pink ribbon banner hanging there on uh, someone who's been affected by breast cancer, right? Or, or whatever it is, right? Um, there's a playground equipment in the yard. Oh, well, there's kids there, right? And then just take a moment to pray for them, right? If you, if, if there's nothing, if, if you can't glean anything, you know, from it, God knows what they need. You pray a more general prayer. But just walk through your community and take a moment to pray um, for the people in your neighborhood. If you see somebody out walking their dog or something like that, or going for a walk, you get a chance to talk to them, great. If uh, the subject comes up, tell them what you're doing. Ask them if there's anything that you can pray for them. Um... <clears throat> it's amazing when you say I'm praying is there anything that I can pray for you about it's amazing how responsive people are to that no matter where they're at spiritually because what it comes down to is most people go well I don't know about this but it can't hurt and I can use all the help I can get <laughs> um but then just make sure if you tell someone you're going to pray for them that you do it. And then look for an opportunity to follow up. Because when you come back to, to them a couple months later and say, so I've been praying for you, how's that going? They're going to go, what you have? Oh, you actually did? <laughs> and, and, and you've had me in mind all this time wow you must really care I mean they might not say it like that right but chances are that's what their experience is going to be and you just show them what the love of Christ looks like all right so next time invitation that's the nuts and bolts all right Let's close the prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways that you've given us to be filled with your gospel. Don't let us get so distracted by all of the things, all the busyness in this world, all of the opportunities to, to fill other buckets, whether it's legitimate needs or just, you know, the... the those things that seem so urgent but aren't necessarily. Help us to recognize that we can't fill from an empty bucket and that you have so many blessings for us and that, that, that even Jesus took time, all the time, to pray and to, to, to be with you. And, um, and so help us to, to recognize the value of that so that we just have to. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, one more on that. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, um, you know, when it comes to, to rest, where like actually just resting, taking time, like, okay, I need to set aside time for myself to, to you know, to get filled. And I need to take some time off just to get filled up, right? And sometimes people, people say, well, the devil doesn't take a day off. You know, he's going to keep going, so I got to keep, you know, I got to keep fighting him. <laughs> and, the, and the response to that is, since when do you get your, uh, your since when is the devil your role model? <laughs> <laughs>